out in uh, Bacone, and this kind of places you where we're at in uh, Italy. So we're basically, here's Rome, we're studying this entire region here as part of the greater, uh, part of the project. We're basically um, studying all of the Roman habitation in the area, and part of this is excavating at one habitation site in particular, a, a Roman villa that's in a little town called Vacone. Anyway, here's kind of a blow up of the map, and it shows you exactly where the villa we're studying is. And the circle here is the greater study region that we're working on. And uh, we're trying to map all the sites, uh, Roman sites basically that we can, that's in this study region. So all villas, any settlements, we're mapping these on a GIS, we're de developing a GIS database. We're also trying to figure out where all roads were, waterways, and any tombs, because we're actually finding that some of these subroads uh, branching off the, the bigger Roman roads actually have quite a large number of tombs on them, which is not unusual for the ancient world, but it's really helping us to map and figure out you know, where things are in the region. And uh, today, really, though, what I'm going to focus on instead of this whole project we're working on is really what we do with the field school, which is excavating at this site called the, the Villa of Horus at this little town called Bacone. And uh, again, just a few other things about the region. So we've got the Tiber River that runs right here. This is, these are the Monte Sabini here off to the east. And so we're kind of in between both of these big landmarks here. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is the land of the ancient Sabines. You see the words Sabina in there. I'm sure if you've done any reading in Latin literature, you've probably run into this group before. This was an ethnic group uh, that was absorbed pretty early on in the Roman state. I'm, I'm sure you've heard the rape of the Sabine women before. That is probably just a metaphor for the Roman takeover of this area. And later it becomes just about as Roman as any other place in Italy. And uh, the Roman nobility, um, oops, sorry about that. The Roman nobility basically uh, started buying up uh, land in the area and planting down villas. Now for those of you not sure what a villa is, basically it's a big farm that basically agriculturally exploits the territory around it especially with uh, planting of olive trees, olives producing olive oil, and putting down grapevines to produce wine. Okay? And this region is really actually quite known today still for its olive production. You see some of the landscape here. It's obviously quite beautiful. Basically, uh, it consists of mountains that go off to the east with rolling hills like this that go down to the river valley itself. Here's a little bit of... Whoop. Here's a little bit of what the uh, uh, topography looks like and other sites that we found in the area. So you can see we've found a number of villas on our own that were already known. We've actually found two, discovered two that were previously completely unknown. And uh, from the Roman period, there was really only one Roman settlement, Roman uh, village or little town in the area. And that was basically right here at a town called Forum Novum. Uh, the town basically just seems to have grown up organically. It wasn't planted down by the Romans, but there were lots of villas and other settlements in the area, and there was probably at some point a need felt to have some kind of center for people to meet at, and that's why we have Forum Novum right here that just kind of sprouts up. And um, you can see where Vacone is. I, I've kind of uh, put the red circle or, or red square around it so you can see it. And uh, placing it in the hills in the countryside here. <laughs> Place in the countryside here, there's the actual village of Vacone there on the mountainside, and the arrow is pointing to where our villa is located. The location of the villa itself is kind of interesting because Cato and other agricultural writers say when you put your villa somewhere, you should pick the south side of the mountain. That way, it maximizes the amount of sunlight exposure and also protects you from the north wind. And that's exactly what we've got here at Vacone. It's basically on behind a mountain facing towards the south, just where we would expect this to be. The village of Vacone, right up on top of the hill above us, is a village of about 200 people, about 70 of which live there all year round. So very tiny place now. Uh, you can kind of look at it and it, you can get a sense about just the region and, and how uh, it feels a bit remote while you're there, but we're actually about 30, 40 miles from Rome. Let's see. Uh, on the map here. Okay, so the Villa of Horus itself, this just gives you a sense about what we found and some of the, the basics of it. We have a very early level from uh, 
about 100 BC when the villa is first built and the terrace that it's on is first constructed. Then around 1 BC or so, the entire villa is reconstructed, okay, or uh, is uh, renovated. And then around 150 uh, CE AD, the, the whole villa is damaged, probably by an earthquake. And then there's occupation after then, but then we find an abandonment around 200 to 225 AD, okay? The Republican period, uh, that uh, part of the villa that we found has uh, an interesting floor style called opus scutellatum. Only about 25 examples of this flooring style exist. Now, I'll show you an example of it uh, a little, in a little bit. The imperial period is where most of our villa comes from, and this has lots of mosaics and painted wall plaster, as we'll see. It also has an interesting dome structure on it that may have early on been a uh, part of a bath complex, a private bath complex for the villa. But that whole area around it is later converted into a uh, work area, so it's given over to agricultural work, which is another thing that's kind of interesting about it. Um, we have found two olive pressing emplacements, so two presses for the uh, placement of olives, and we've also found a wine pressing in installation, uh, which we just found this past year. Um, in a period after the villa was abandoned, we've actually so far found six burials on site. For whatever reason, people buried people on this location. We're not entirely sure why you would do that, but people in the Middle Ages and later felt this was a good place to, to bury people. And uh, we've found about 12,000 pieces of ceramic so far, most of it within the past uh, uh, season and a half or so. Okay. And then finally, we have this interesting uh, thing I'm not really going to talk about here. I talked about it last year, uh, uh, that uh, the site was believed to be the villa of the poet Horace by some local people. And actually, we found a couple of forged inscriptions from a later period trying to bolster that claim. So it's kind of interesting. Here's what the site looked like before we started work on there. And uh, we started work in 2012. This photo is from, um, well, it's from 2010, but this is what it looked like in 2011 when we started there. There were two known pieces to it. You can see down in the, in the two circled areas. And these were, basically, you can see where, where we've gotten so far. There was an upper cryptoporticus, okay, which you can see that's what it looked like when we first started. There was a lower cryptoporticus, this down here. And then there was that domed area I mentioned to you, which, which has always been visible. Okay, So what we decided to do, OK, you've got these landmarks in place. We will just excavate between them and, and see what's there. And that this uh, area between where we're working seems to have been the main part of the villa itself. Just to give you a sense about what this looked like, in the 1980s, this is what it looked like before they did any uh, restoration of it. And that's what it looks like now. <laughs> you can see they did a lot of work on it in the 1980s. And unfortunately for us, they didn't keep very good records about this. So we're trying, still trying to piece together exactly what was restored in the 1980s and what's ancient Roman. And here's what the interior of this space looks like. Uh, this is not down to the ancient ground level. There's probably a couple more meters to go down to the ground level. But you can see it's filled with from the centuries of mud and other, other things piling in. So that's what, we, that's what we had going in. That was the knowledge we had. The other kind of important uh, structure that's around us is a very fancy little restaurant that abuts the property right here. Solo Perdue, the most romantic restaurant in the world. It's actually one of the more expensive ones in the world, too. It's like 600 euros for a dinner for two people for the night. But anyway, they're our neighbors, and they're extremely helpful to us. But interesting little factoid about the area. This is where we've gotten so far. So we started out just knowing about the Cryptoporticus structure and the, the structure up there labeled as cistern. So in the past four years, we managed to do everything else that you kind of see on the map. And again, we found most of the living area of the villa and a good chunk of what was the productive area where they're processing agricultural things. And uh, one of the things kind of interesting is our stratigraphy, what we're finding in the ground, is pretty uniform. We have uh, on the mosaic floor from the imperial level, we have an abandonment phase. Then we have a phase that's uh, called pise. It's basically the mud brick walls. All the walls were made of mud brick resting on stone foundation. And that's usually preserved for us very nicely on top of the abandonment phase. Then we have the roof and plaster, which came down as uh, the, the walls crumbled. And then we've got our topsoil layer. 
So as we dig, it's a pretty uniform uh, setup. But one of the problems that we have is all across the site, later agricultural work has kind of cut rows, you can see, all across the site, and it's left us with this kind of thing, okay? So people plowing to, to plant things in the site have ripped big lines, you can see, all across it, and planted trees, like one there, for example, okay? And most of this work, we think, was of vine trenches. Um, but these cuts where they've been made in the floor levels of the imperial mosaic have actually been kind of useful because it's allowed us to see what's underneath. And that's how we found that there's an earlier Republican phase. You can see when we dig in those holes, we found really nice Republican floors. And then occasionally, we can see from subsidence and other settling of the site where earlier walls have been, too. So we're slowly trying to draw up a bit of a map of what was there in that first villa phase from all of this. Anyway, I mentioned this, but we found tons of painted wall plaster all over the site. So uh, this villa had two functions. It was a fancy summer residence for some rich Roman who had it nicely decorated with nice walls and mosaics, but it also had this other productive function, and those two locations were actually quite near each other. Okay? But anyway, you can see from our painted wall plaster here, we've got uh, Looks kind of like a flower here. We've also found what may be a Medusa head. We're not really sure, but you can kind of see the snakes going off of it there. And these rings we still haven't found in analog for another uh, painting, which is uh, kind of interesting. And you can see that some of the plaster is still on the walls, where the walls survive, the stone courses of the walls. But most of it has come detached, and you can see here what it looks like when it comes out. We've got to take these together, and we sort of try to piece bits of it together. To, to figure out what the walls in the villa actually look like. We've also found a lot of decorative stucco in different places. This would have been in the wall, in, um, up on the walls inside the rooms. So these like moldings and things would have decorated all over the interior of the building. And of course, we've found lots of mosaic floors. So you've heard mosaic before, right? In later periods, mosaics can be on floors, but they can also be on walls. Like in churches, right? In the apse of a church, you would have mosaic decoration a lot of time. Well, in the Roman period, this is all on the floor, okay? So all our floors are decorated in different styles. And we've actually found 20 different kinds of flooring style. And uh, in those earlier phases, the Republican phases, that's where we found this special kind of flooring over here called opus scutellatum. And I know it's not necessarily the prettiest of all these things, but it's actually one of the more interesting ones, academically speaking, because it's, it's pretty rare. There's only like 20, 30 examples of this kind of flooring that survives down to us. In addition to interesting, uh, just pr having pretty mosaics, we've also found a number of interesting repair jobs that people did to the floor throughout the, the, the period. So you can see here was the standard sort of way this floor was supposed to look. And then at some point, you can see they had to do a repair to it. And you can see that they did a weird job of it. They sort of used bigger blocks in different places, maybe not quite so nice, but they did what they could to repair this floor in kind of interesting ways. And uh, we found this in other parts of the villa too. You can see here was the original mosaic, and then here was an attempt at repairing it. And actually with this one, they started to repair it like this, and then they gave up. They never actually finished the repairs. They tried to fix this room and went, ah, screw it. We don't need a mosaic in this room, so they just basically put down, they just sort of gave it up after, after trying to fix it in some way, okay? Anyway, I only want to talk today about a couple of the discoveries we made this past year. So I'm going to focus on basically these two areas you see on the map in front of you. I'm going to talk about this interesting area down here and then give a, a, an overview of what our productive area is like. Anyway, that first area. Okay, In 2013, we were digging, and somebody found a cavity. They found basically a hole in the ground, which is a little weird to find a hollow spot in the middle of the ground. As we kept digging, we found, oh my god, there's a tunnel here that goes down. And what we found was, this was actually a tunnel, you were looking from over here down, that goes all the way down from the upper level down into the Cryptoporticus. It's kind of interesting. And it had a little side tunnel going off to the side. So the past few years, we've been slowly digging this out. And you can see the tunnel, what it looks like now, okay? 
it actually has tons of uh, the pizze from the old walls that used to be there has run down in there. And uh, it's about like 10 feet deep. So we've been slowly going through this. But it's actually yielded like a sixth of all of our pottery from the site. So it's been very uh, useful what it's provided. So you can see going down, you can see where you can see the lower cryptoporticus. And then the side room here, that's what that side room sort of looks like that we found. Okay. And here's the view from the way out, along with uh, just one of the examples of the pieces of pottery that we found that, had, that show that the, the, it was occupied in the um, second century, it seems. It was still being used in the second century. Eventually, we've dug down and we found a floor level with a nice little drain and a sort of red clay floor. And we started wondering about this side passage. What the heck could this weird side passage be? Okay. We understood, okay, you might want a, a passage from the upper level of the villa down into the lower level. That makes sense, right? Just to be able to pass through. But why do they have this weird side passage here? Well, when you go in that little space and look up, you see that. So we're like, what is that? That looks like a finished cap to the top of the ceiling. And then here's what the view looks like from that space outward. So to try to figure this out, we decided to put down a trench right over the hole from the top to dig down and figure out what that little passage and hole is supposed to be. And our initial digging found this. Found the hole with a bunch of weird stones and other stuff mortar on top of it. So somebody at some point decided to cover it up because it was dangerous having a hole there. So they decided to cover it. And you can see it's like in the corner of a room. Then when we removed all that, we found this. Mosaic floor with this nice hole that's respected you know, when they put down the mosaic, it's got nice stone around it and everything. And it's kind of strange. When you go inside, you look up, you can see that the whole underground chamber was built so that, you know, with this hole in mind, it's, you can see it's kind of corbelled up to where the, the hole is uh, supposed to be. Okay? So, as you look at the map here, the mosaic that's here is also shared over on this trench, too. So it looks like that this hole is actually part of a big room, okay? So they have a nice big room, nice mosaic, wall painting and everything, but it has a weird hole in it in one corner. So we've been trying to figure out what this is, and our best guess is this was maybe a, a latrine, like it was a bathroom, so that somebody had some collecting pot down there that they collected waste in. Or maybe it was for garbage. But why would you have a fancy cut hole in a nice room that had a bathroom in it. <laughs> so we still don't know exactly what this space is for, right? Our best guess right now is it's just a nice bathroom, so far as we can tell. The other thing that's kind of interesting is that this passage is later closed up. You can see right here. And we've never actually found a way that you got from the, that lower passage up into the room up top. We found no cuttings, there's no steps, there's no rungs, places to rest the ladder. So we're not entirely sure what it was doing. Maybe it was like a dumbwaiter thing. They could put things up that they ferried up to the upper level. We're not really sure. But at some point, they felt it wasn't necessary, so they actually closed it up. So kind of fascinating. The other thing is we found another underground space, it looks like, in another part of the villa. We found one over here. So you can see the top of a vault that we found underground. So there may be more of these things. And actually, we found yet another one we were pretty sure right about here, too. So we're still trying to figure out what these underground passages are. Are they simply places for servants to be able to communicate with the rest of the uh, villa? Not entirely clear. Okay, questions, anything? If anybody has any ideas, please let me know. We're going to keep digging. Well, our plan is basically to just basically remove everything around here so we can see that space better, see if that reveals anything. We'd like to dig more in the tunnel, but as you might have seen, part of it's collapsed, and it's getting a little dangerous to be down there. So we're not so sure if we're going to be able to do that in the future. OK. The other part of the villa I want to talk about is this productive area up at the top. Okay. So by productive area, essentially what they're doing is they're bringing in agricultural goods, especially olives and grapes, and they're pressing these. So and this seems to have been the primary way most villas made money, was pressing olives and grapes. Okay. Anyway, previous excavations, we've found uh, these two pressing emplacement spots. And in front of them are these interesting boxes. And from uh, 
see a picture there. Ah, here we go. We have surmised that this is a kind of press that's known in other places, in particular in Spain. So basically, here's where you place your olives. You have the press over top. Those boxes are to hold a mechanism that you screw down, and it presses the olives for you. And then the olive oil runs in these channels down to another area where they're collected. Okay? And by the way, Cato, one of our ancient authors, says that if you have you need two sets of pressing emplacements if you have 120 yugara of land given over to olive production. And that's about 75 modern acres. So that might give us, in fact, a sense of how big, whoops, how big the actual villa's grounds were. Anyway, all that pressing goes over to this area over at the top. So it all runs down. You've pressed your olives. All the oil runs down into that location up there. And we have this interesting vat system over here for collecting the olive oil. So the olives get pressed, and just here's a little scale to let you know how, how big some of these vats are. They're actually pretty sizable. What you would do is the, you'd press your olive oil. It'd run down in here. There's a little uh, tunnel that connects these two vats. So the olive oil comes in here. It gets separated in this vat. The junk that you've pressed out gets separated. The oil runs into that next vat over here, and it floats up to the top and drains through the top into a room that's below that collects the olive oil. Okay? And that produces extra virgin olive oil. I'm sure you've heard this before, but that's the first pressing that you get out of olive oil. Okay? Well, the next vat, okay, what you, the, for the next pressing, for the non-extra virgin olive oil, what you do is you block this up, and you drain it down into vat three, okay, the, the far vat. And that produces your not as good olive oils, which in the ancient world especially means oils that you use especially for lamps. Okay, so this is the lamp oil of the ancient world. Okay, so it's interesting. We have analogs of this in other sites, so we can uh, basically use that to interpret and understand what this vat system is doing for us. Okay. Anyway, for 2015, we decided to expand our digging over to uh, just to the right of this. And those of you who were there in previous years, remember, this is a big hill, right? So we actually had to dig away a lot of this with some machinery and then do a lot of heavy digging to get down to those levels. Anyway, what we found was two interesting areas. Up here, we found a wine pressing area. And down here, we found a dolium, a gigantic storage vessel that had been kind of wrestled out of place a little bit. Anyway, the olive vat looks, or the wine vat looks like this. If I can get it back here. <laughs> Looks like this. So there's a treading floor up there. You smash down your grapes, and the wine runs down into this big vat here that we haven't actually completely excavated because we just found this, of course, as you find all good things, right at the end of our excavation season. So it all got collected down there. <laughs> Sorry about this. You can see there's a nice little step so you can get down in there and uh, collect the uh, wine even. Okay. Then over to the south there is a big dolium. So a dolium is a gigantic vessel made of ceramic that stores things in the ancient world. This one was actually found on its side. And what this seems to indicate is somebody at a later period found it, tried to dig it out, it cracked, and they gave up on it and left it on its side there, it seems. Okay? We found other fragments of dolia around the site. But it, it's still kind of interesting and good to find one that's actually more or less where it was probably being used. So it gives us an idea what some of the space might have been used for. Okay. Anyway, other things that we did in 2015 is we decided to dig in the first room there of that upper Cryptoporticus. So that space there, and that's what we found inside. Oops. That hole up there is where the uh, vat two drained the uh, oil from before I showed you. So it was collected down here. We found a system of essentially uh, drains. We found other holes for placing uh, storage vessels. Okay, so kind of confirmed what we suspected that this was a work area. It also confirmed that unlike what we had originally thought, that room over there was not a cistern. We thought the Italians had linked these artificially together by just basically when they reconstructed it, making a doorway in there. That's actually not the case. It was actually a Roman doorway in there. 
So we suspect that room 22 that we label as cistern is actually some other kind of work area. So we want to do some more work in there to kind of confirm that. But you can see this confirmed that that was indeed an ancient doorway. You can see it's got a stratigraphy that goes all the way down to the Roman levels. Okay. We also dug in the area outside of that doorway and found uh, some more rooms with uh, amphorae, wine storage vessels that were basically in that area. So again, more work area. We're still trying to find where the work area and the living space met, because it would be fascinating to see how that joined together. Could you see the work going on for some nice living area, or was it somehow blocked off? Some of our ancient sources imply you want, it's nice to be able to see what's going on in the work area, because they would sit there and look cool, drink their wine, and watch people work and feel quaint and like they're country gentlemen. So we're wondering if that's the case here, if there was some way of uh, doing that. Okay. Anyway, so this is the uh, recruiting part of this, inviting people who would like to apply. We have a field school that we operate every uh, season, and uh, here's a shot of uh, last year's group. But here's the basics of it. It's a Rutgers study abroad program. Undergraduates who participate earn six credits. Get to uh, excavate at the site that I just described to you, about 35 miles north of Rome. Our dates for 2016, you can see there, July 10 to August 13. We usually take 25 to 30 students, and we have about 12 staff members from different places around uh, the world, actually. Between, we have people from Australia, Britain, Italy, of course, and uh, the US. We live at a local hotel called Agriturismo Lake Lene, I'll show you some shots of. And uh, we work week, weekdays and on weekends, we provide you with transportation from the location to a train that takes you to Rome, okay? But one weekend, we keep you there to see sites in the local area. Um, just so you can get a sense about what it's like. Again, we only work weekdays. You can see our meal schedule there. Okay. We get to site at 7 a.m. We break a few times, and then we work until 1.30. After lunch, stu some students work in the lab. Others clean pottery. Others have the day off. Okay. Once a week, we have a seminar on a specified topic. And then once a week, we also um, have an Italian language instructor who gives you the basics of Italian while you're there. We uh, also have an option if you want to stay and work the final weekend that the project's in place, you can do that in exchange for a free room and board. So if you've run out of money from your previous trips to Rome and <laughs> need to stay there, or if you'd like to, to keep doing work, that is an option for the last weekend. So for the academic experience, basically we, we assume no prior knowledge. Most of the people who are there are uh, anthropology or classics majors, but we, assume, we don't assume any background for people. Uh, you'll work with the supervisor. We'll train you in excavation and recording techniques. Okay? Students are also trained in the use of a total station, which is a piece of land surveying equipment. I'm sure you've seen like the power company guys out with the uh, thing that looks like you know, a box that they're shooting uh, points with lasers in, and that, that's, that's a total station. Some, uh, we do have some students working in our finds lab or who work on conservation, so preserving the mosaic and wall plaster that we have, especially in situ. Okay? And students are graded upon the participation, their site work, a site presentation that we assign everyone, and a trench notebook. Okay, and here's some shots of people in action, looking reasonably happy while they're doing it. The, I, I should point out that this is there's a lot of physical activity, a lot of work involved in this. We're in Italy in July and August, so it's also kind of hot. Okay, but um, most people get along, do it reasonably well. Here's uh, people being trained in. Uh, drawing, you can see, and in uh, working the total station. That's a total station right up there. And you can see some people working on our conservation, so preserving the mosaics and stuff that we uncover. Okay? And just if you're wondering, other, our other weekly seminar topics have varied over the years. We usually always have the one on villas and villa architecture. Uh, we always have one on archae archaeological strat stratigraphy. We also talk about conservation, preservation theory, and methodology. We have a seminar on wa wall painting and mosaics. We uh, have also had people talk about GIS theory and methodology. I mentioned we're building a GIS database to keep track of all the sites in the area, and that's what that would focus on. We've also had an anthropologist teach about osteology, because as I mentioned, we do have like six burials on the site that we've had to deal with, and we're probably going to find more. And if you're wondering, here is where we live. It's a, it's a location nearby. Uh, it's within walking distance of the site, and it's basically a hotel that's basically on a farm the best way to describe it. And it's uh, got some pretty nice rooms. It has a restaurant where we eat all our meals. I think 
uh, the people who've done this before can testify. It's pretty good food and pretty good surroundings to be in. And that is more or less it. And there's who the principals involved in the project are. If you have any questions or anything, be happy to take them about the project or about the field school. That's it. Ah, and it went out. Okay. Lived. That's interesting, because our, our, our literary sources rarely talk about that kind of stuff. But associated with the Sabina area, um, we hear about a lot of seasonal labor being used. And my guess is that since olive pressing and wine pressing are very seasonal, that there probably weren't a huge number of slaves. There were probably a lot of unskilled local free labor that was brought in. That's actually what we hear is the case for different parts of the Sabina. So I'm sure there were slaves around doing a lot of work, but it may have been the day-to-day -day stuff that they were used for. Because if you think about it, you need a lot of labor in very specific periods of time. It's not worth it to pay you know, for people that you don't need for nine months out of the year. So we hear about a lot of seasonal labor being worked out. For those of you who have some Latin, the seasonal labor is called an opera. That's what the guy is called. He's called a work that does this. Incredibly dehumanizing, but that's what we hear that the local guys were called was work, essentially. Anyway, these operai were employed for these things. We hear in other parts of the Sabine, not necessarily right here. But that's what we think's going on. Where they would live is another interesting point, because some people have suggested that actually it's the Cryptoporticus is where they live. Because uh, sometimes they have storage in them, but there's a lot of space that's not obvious what it's for. And they're kind of perfect places to keep people that you want to keep an eye on, because they're like usually deep. They have like controlled entrances and stuff. And for us, they have that little, those little passages that go to different parts of the villa. So, you know, there could be movement without being seen by, you know, the fancy people who live there. So, um, very good questions. We're trying to answer that as we go along. But um, archaeologically, really hard to find who the labor actually is, you know? Yeah. Any other? Bodies have all been found without anything on them, except for we found, actually I should have had a picture of that, I sort of dropped it out, but one of our burials had a papal jubilee pendant from the year 1700. <laughs> it actually has St. Peter on it, and it says 1700. And then on the other side is the picture of the three papal basilicas. So in a papal jubilee year, essentially, if you go and visit those three churches, you get a dispensation from the Pope, like automatically for doing the pilgrimage. Anyway, we found this associated with one of the bodies, but not on it. So we don't know if it was his or some, and the body was also disturbed before we got there. So we wondered if somebody didn't find the body, went, oh, geez, that's terrible, and threw something they thought was like holy in there to kind of make up for it. But the guy is like actually buried kind of like this in there. So it looks like he was accidentally dug up and thrown back in. But somehow when his body was still articulated, which means there was still flesh in there. All very weird, but we're, we're still trying to piece it together, but we're going to do some carbon dating to try to figure out the dates. But that's the only item we found that might be associated with it. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, yeah, we had two child burials. They had nothing associated with them, which you would expect they would. One we actually found last year was a neonatal, uh, like literally a two-week-old two baby that was, do you remember that channel inside the room? was basically right in the middle of the channel. So we think that one actually might be ancient. But there's so little of it that survives that we probably can't do any testing on it. But because it's in the middle of that channel, we suspect that actually could be ancient, or towards the end of the ancient period. Uh, yeah, thanks. Any other questions? There's another, the, the only other villa in the entire area that's been built is nicer than ours. <laughs> and, uh, well, you do Republic, you know uh, Roman history. It's actually the Aureli Ikatai that owned the villa. There's like a couple of stamps that have been found on pottery that have their name. 
It was rare, very, very rare to be able to associate a particular family with it. And it dates to like the third century BC to like the fifth century AD or so. Anyway, theirs is nicer than ours. Ours, the mosaics, a lot of them look marble, but they're not. They're stone. There's also lots of weird repairs, like I showed you the mosaic floors, that they don't care about, clearly, like jamming pottery in the wall to try to keep it from falling out and stuff. And there's no, there's no second, there's no, uh, we haven't found stairs to an upper level, and there probably won't be because our walls are made of pise. And at the other side, they're actually made of masonry. So we think that at least these, they, they were probably rich, but not as rich as the guys down the road. That's uh, just a guess. But then again, you know, the, the nobility owned lots of villas. This could have just been one that a, ri a really rich guy happened to own that he rarely used and just made him money on the side. So anyway, there's some evidence it's not as nice as, as it could be. Yep. And I forgot to show it here. We actually found one room that seems to be, a woman seems to have used because we found a, a cosmetic uh, lid for a cosmetic box. And we also found um, a makeup implement too, so something you'd smear makeup on that was in one room together. So that might have actually been a woman's room. I forgot to put the finds up there. Oh, well. Any other? Yeah, Oliver. Yeah, we, we, I showed you the one that we've got from uh, the tunnel. We've found probably five that had some kind of stamp or identifying thing. They're all pretty much from the second century. So they're, and they're well-known things like that, that style. We also have, uh, I, we didn't get a photo of it because we just found it at the end of the year and cleaned it up, but we have a lamp that actually has a chariot race on it, which is kind of cool too. So we, we just found that towards the end. And um, yeah. Otherwise, mo the ceramic all kind of, for the, clearly the, the, the imperial level is like what I showed you from all the, the stuff we found going down to like first century CE and done by the third century. And then we have found a couple of pieces on that Republican floor that date about 100 BC to kind of confirm the dates of those. Yeah. And you, you remember Tyler. Tyler's doing nothing but working on the, mo the, the ceramic next year because we've just found so much. He's getting overwhelmed. So we're just going to, that's all he's doing next year. Any other questions or? Yep, thank you.